All right, welcome guys. Rob Tatro here. I have a special guest today, none other than Johnson Joseph, CEO of Tenet, uh, formerly Peak. Great to have you here. Thank you for taking the time on, for being here today. Of course, Rob. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's been a while. Yeah, it's, it's been, been a while. We, I've been really well. How, how have you been? I've I've been well as well. Um, markets are a little bit tough. I'm sure you can really, I'm sure you can understand that. But other than that, uh, things are great. Right on. Okay, no more small talk. Let's get right into it. <laughs> um, so I, I my job here is to ask you the questions that my my investors and other investors are asking. So they want to know what's going on with the stock. Uh, last time I was very uh, nice to you. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to be rude, but I definitely want to ask some questions to you today. First off, I'm going to ask you about the revenue projection. This is probably the, the question you get the most. The revenue projection for 2022. Q1 uh, top line came in around 32 million, 34 million, Q1 and Q2, 65 million. Your, your last guidance had it at 210 million. It seems like a big stretch to get Q3 and Q4. You need about 140 million. You need about 70 million a quarter. That's more than doubling. Is that reachable? You know what? Um, t- typically, um, if you follow a company, you know that the third quarter and the fourth quarter are usually the best quarters uh, for the company in terms of revenue. Uh, things have been difficult, like in China, um, because of COVID, like the economy is not the same. Um, there's been a slowdown. But uh, from the discussions that we've had with our team uh, with boots on the ground in China, they're telling us so far there are no reasons um, to revise guidance or anything like that. So we're, we're, we're staying the course as it stands today. Um, we're looking at maybe just hitting the number. We could be a slightly above, slightly below. We'll know a lot more after we get through, um, I'd say, mid-November. But so far, uh, uh we have no reason to to change anything. Okay, so last two last two quarters have been 30 33 34. You're basically saying you're going to come close to doubling that for Q3 and Q4. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. So 200 million still on the table for top line. Uh EBITDA and net income. So those are, are have been dramatically uh, forecasted down. You were predicting something like 82 million of EBITDA, and that's now forecasting a positive number of 6.5 in your last guidance. You're down about 10 mil so far this year in EBITDA. That would mean a flip of about 8 mil per quarter. So positive EBITDA of 8 mil per Q. Is that still, that, that one's still potential? Uh, that one's a little bit trickier. Like, I mean. Um, so you, that's a no. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it, it's not that, the, that it's a no. Like, I mean, um, so on the EBITDA, we should be okay. But net income, we're looking at, you know, um, the heartbeat platform is has not been performing for for reasons we've stated in the past, right? Um, there are some delays in investments, so the heartbeat platform is not producing um, at the levels that we would expect it to produce. So this was an acquisition for us, right? So we're gonna have some uh, discussions with uh, uh, with our auditors, kind of like giving a preview a little bit, but uh, we're gonna have some discussions with our auditors. Because the, 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 the forecasted revenue and, and profitability that was expected to come from that platform it, it, it is not going to hit the numbers, right? Like, I mean, we're not going to hit those numbers. What that means is that we may have to um, uh, 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 take another impairment, so to speak, on the asset, on the value. So, so, so that will have an impact on, on net income, right? But it's not so much like, you know, the operations per se, or whatever. We're really looking at uh, impairment of the asset that might affect the, uh, uh, um, the net income. How much income is the value. asset on the books right now? How much is that asset on the books right now? You know what? Um, that's a question for, I, I, I should pay more attention to, uh, you know, um, cause there'll what, be an impairment, uh, you, you, it, it, it's, not, it's not. It's not going to be the entire value of the asset. It's just going to be like a portion, and that, and that portion, honestly, like I mean, we don't know at this point. Like I mean, until we actually do the uh, 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 the exercise and have the meetings with uh, 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 with our auditors to discuss it. So, but it's a significant lines, we don't know. It's significant. It, it's not like ten percent of that. It's it's like thirty or forty or fifty percent of that asset. I don't think it's going to be in that range, to be honest with you. I don't think it's okay. going to be that high, but it'll, it'll certainly be um, at the level where it has an impact on on, on the bottom line, let's just say. And, okay. and again, I don't know what that impact is going to be. 
But as I far as that. okay, so but as far as like the top line uh, and the EBITDA, we should be fine. Okay, and then just quickly, 2023 is a big jump. I think I I, re- I think I recall seeing like what is it? S- 800 or 600 or something no, like that? No, I said the, the revised guidance that was put out was uh, five something, a little five something. 500 million. Yes. Right. So from, from 200 to five, that's a two and a half X. Is that, that seems a lot. You know what? Like, I mean, if you look at our company, going back to, to, to the history of our company, every time we put numbers out, people are like, whoa, that seems like a lot. Like, I mean, in 2018, uh, Rob, when we started out, we did uh, uh, 1.6. 1.6. We did 1.6, and yeah. we came out with guidance uh, at the level of nine point something. It was a little over nine. I can't remember the exact figure. Uh, and people were like, "Whoa!" Like, I mean, you're going from one to nine, and we ended up doing eleven. And then when yeah. we put out the guidance uh, um, for, I, I think for the following year, I can't remember what the amount was, but we beat it. It was more than double whatever, and. This year, uh, for 20, well, this past year for 2021, uh, we had forecasted 300. We had to scale it back because of, again, uh, I don't want to go back on the reasons why we did that, but the business is growing at that rate, Rob. So we're not, uh, uh, when we put out the numbers out there, uh, it's not exaggerated. Like, I mean, there, there, there are factors for, for, for the, um, I guess the uh, revised guidance, there are things that we could not have foreseen that affected at us. But still, like, I mean, we still came around over 100 million in 2021. And this year, we're going to double that. Excuse me, for 2022, we should be able to double that and then continue on that pace of doubling, uh, at least doubling the revenue for the next two to three years. Okay. So what would you say to the, to the uh, YouTuber or the Redditor that's saying, why is Johnson promising the moon instead promise a little less and don't don't pull back your guidance like be a little more conservative with with your forecast listen you know what that's a fair question when when we look at uh, um the assumptions right because the numbers come from assumptions rob okay what can be expected uh in this line of business this this vertical that vertical and uh, uh these are partners for the most part that we're dealing with that um they've been around they've been around for a long long time in business right so they give us their numbers based on the, their use of our services. We look at their numbers and we're like, okay, you know what? This is very realistic for us to make these numbers. And then, believe it or not, we discount. Uh, we, 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 we discount uh, uh, the values that we get from them, right? So we're a little bit more conservative. We were actually looking to surprise the market positively uh, uh, when we put out those numbers. So the company has that potential. So when people are saying, okay, promising the moon, I understand that the value, like, I mean, the numbers are, are, are big numbers, right? But that's the space that we're in. That's the kind of company that we have. So I'm very comf- comfortable, um, putting those numbers. I, I, I know in the past, okay, we did not meet the, those numbers, but we're trying to give people an accurate picture of the company's potential. Yeah. You'd agree with me though, though, Johnson, that, you know, forecasting 9 million and making 11, is is quite a bit different than forecasting 300 and coming in at 200. That that's we're not talking apples and apples and oranges or apples and apples. Right. Listen. N- listen. I I totally understand that, Rob. Okay. But again, had things gone according to what was expected, right? We would have we would have hit those numbers without okay. a doubt, and we'd have exceeded that. those numbers. I respect that. So this comes back down to the question of of trust and the investors, you know, do they have trust in your ability to forecast? And I guess the market right now is saying, no, they don't believe that you're going to hit your 200. Obviously, the stock, I think that the stock is a reflection of the fact that they think 200 is not reachable and they think 600 or sorry, 500 is not reachable. Would you agree or would you disagree with that? You know what? To be honest with you, Rob, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. Whatever the market is doing right now, to be honest with you, I'm okay with it. We're not here basically uh, for today. Uh, next month or whatever, we're building a business, right? So whatever the market thinks is fair for us right now, we're fine. We're going to continue to execute our business plan and deliver on the numbers that we're putting forth. You know, it, it's it's as simple as that. So I would agree. I, th- I think your view on that is fantastic. Focus on the things you can control and you what you can control is your company and your top line and your bottom line. But what would you say to the potential problem of cash flow and dilution in an equity raise situation? So like is 
Tenet going to run out of cash? Um, uh, no, we're not going to run out of cash. Listen, um, what I, what I just explained to you, uh, um, Rob is the potential behind the company, right? So the people who invest in our company, I, I understand, like, I mean, we're, we're still a penny stock company and people are looking, you know, to get in, get out, you know, make a little bit of money, flip, whatever, right? But for the most part, we have investors that are here with us for the long term, right? So I, when I speak to these people, they understand, Rob, that what we've done in China has been nothing more than a proof of concept. And what I mean by that is, People are still focused right now on supply chain, this, that, whatever in China. That's how we started, right? But this is not what the company is all about. I keep telling people, we, at the core, we are an analytics and artificial intelligence company, right? So what our company should be judged on, we have not even put that business model forth yet. So what we did in China was prove the concept that if we offer certain services, we offer value to businesses, those businesses would be willing to give us access to their data, to give us access to their information. And financial institutions would also be willing to be part of this ecosystem because without the financial institutions willing to lend based on the information, the analytics or whatever, their own criteria, the mixture of everything else, and buy into this concept, there is no business hub, right? So we're building a business hub and we needed small businesses and financial institutions to buy into the concept. Now, the model that we have in China was a model that we use because, you know, let's face it, Tenet is a publicly traded company and uh, uh, people are impatient about revenue, whatever, you know, uh, uh, profitability. We understand that it's it's important, right? So we've decided basically to employ a model where we charge fees for those services. But ultimately, when you look at what we're looking to do, which is to build this global network, Rob, uh, similar to, 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 to LinkedIn, to Facebook, where you have small and medium-sized business owners and, and, and executives that are utilizing the services that are provided by the hub, they're interacting with each other. There is a t- like We're getting information directly from their accounting software systems. There is a ton of information that we have access to. Can you j- just think about this for a moment, right? So we have our, our hands into the accounting software systems of small and medium-sized businesses. We do that in China right now. We're going to do it in Canada, in the U.S., uh, U.K., France, eventually all over the world. So, 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 so the company that, that your investors, that you know, our, our investors are investing it. Perhaps they're not aware of it. This is the company that you're investing in. You're investing in a company that is going to have info, access to information uh, on small and medium-sized businesses all over the world. We're going to have a perspective on things, on economies all over the globe, Rob, that nobody has right now. We're positioning ourselves to become one of the most powerful market research, business intelligence, and artificial intelligence companies in the world. That's the end so game. So are you saying are you saying that this is going to create different revenue streams that Absolutely. you're not yet that's exactly that's so exactly that's part what of this I'm play saying. here. Yes. So 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 whatever's coming out of China right now, yes, it's a hundred million, two hundred million, whatever and stuff like that. It's 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 based on a model. It's great revenue. Uh profit margins are going to eventually get to twenty five to thirty percent I, it, it's taking a little time, but it's going to get there. But ultimately, what we want is monetizing the fact that we are going to be this analytics company, uh, the data, how we utilize the data, how we monetize the data. And we're not talking about margins of like, you know, 20 to 30 percent here. We're talking like 50, 60 percent. So overall, when you look at Tenet as a group, like, you know, generating revenue in China and Canada and the U.S. and Europe, South America, the Middle East, whatever, right? So you're going to be looking at a company that has margins of 40 to 50, 60 percent overall. Right. But, but Johnson, again, like that, we're talking years, like the, the investors are worried about today's revenue because they are worried. You're a penny stock. I'm mm-hmm. going to ask you this question again. What's the cash position of tenant? What's the cash position today? Um, okay, between, you have to understand, Tenet is Canada right now, and it's China, right? So as we stand today, we have maybe seven, eight million. I don't have the exact okay, What's numbers. the burn like, rate? It's, what's it's the burn about, rate monthly? It's about two million uh, per month, right? Two million. And about, are you cash flow positive today? Uh, we are not in Canada overall. 
we're almost break even because okay. we're cash flow positive uh, in China. So China, the, 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 the Chinese operations are generating enough cash basically to sustain the business in China. Okay. But, yeah, go ahead. But it's, it's not doing enough to sustain China and Canada. No, it's not. Not at this stage, no. Okay, so there's a cash shortage. You know what my next question is going to be. You're sitting on $7 million. You get a little bit of a slowdown in China. You're not quite getting the same revenue. Right. Where does, where does Tenet go in that situation? How do you raise capital? Because here's how companies like you go bankrupt. I think you know mm-hmm. they can't raise capital or they're diluting at their client. They're, they're diluting their shareholders at 10 to 1 or 15 to 1 because they're raising money at 50 cents and 60 cents. When the stock, you know, in their mind is worth five bucks and now you have significant dilution and then the company just goes down the cycle of, of not being able okay, to two, return shareholder okay, two, equity. Two, all right. So two things, Rob, right? So, um, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Like I'm, I'm extremely confident. Like, I mean, I talked to, uh, prospective investors. Like, I mean, people that have supported the company, like I mentioned before, that have been with us for years, right? So they understand the vision. They know what we're building. So. When, when we talk to these people about potentially investing in the company, they jump at the opportunity, right? So okay. I don't have to go out there and like, oh my God, like, I mean, please invest in, in, in Tenet. We're going to go. No, like I have people right now. Like, I mean, um, literally, like, I mean, just like sending me mad, those, those who have my, uh, my contact information, texting me, emailing me, asking to be on the president's list or whatever, because we have a prospectus offering right now in the works, right? Where we're looking to raise $30 million. There are no issues with that financing whatsoever. What price are you doing that at again? It's going to be priced in the context of the market, right? So we have not priced it yet. Uh, but people are, 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 are coming in. Listen, Johnson, whatever it's priced at, I want X number of units or whatever and stuff like that. So last year, Rob, when we, when we did a, the, the prospectus offering, again, we said we wanted to do 15 million, one five, right? We ended up at 50 million. I'm not saying that this is going to happen again, but people who understand, I keep going back to that, people who understand, what yeah. this company is building, they have no issues about investing into the company. But it's still significant dilution, right? How many total okay. shares outstanding in the company right now? Okay, so right right now there are roughly a uh, hundred million shares uh, yeah. issued. So you're going to issue thirty million shares at a buck, basically. If we if we if we were to issue if we if we were to price it out a dollar, yes, thirty million shares out a buck. But my my reply to that, uh, Rob, is the following, right? So we take this money, we continue to build value. We hit on those numbers. You're talking about 2023, okay? Half half a billion in revenue, right? And roughly, I would say, on a consolidated basis, we're looking at maybe like you know, uh, 15% margins, right? So, so positive net income. That's for 2023. 2024, we're looking at over a billion dollars. And these are numbers that are public. We're not shy about like you know putting like this. I'm not shy about discussing these numbers because it, the numbers are out there. They're part of our presentation. So we're looking at a billion dollars in revenue, and I think 25 percent or something like that, like uh, 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 margins. So a company with that profile, Rob, right? We're not looking at a company that has a hundred million dollar market cap, right? So we're taking the 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 the, uh, the financing, the raise. We're building value for our shareholders. So instead of looking at this, oh, I'm going to be diluted. No, like, I mean, the company is, we're taking the money, right? But we're building value. The overall appreciation of the company's market capitalization is going to be such that as an investor, you're standing, even if you don't participate in this race, you're going to win, not lose from what we're going to be doing. Well, yeah, the alternative is not pretty, right? If you guys don't raise the capital and you're not able to meet your needs and China slows down a bit and there's a bit of yeah. a recession and you're cash flow negative and you run out of cash, the alternative is not pretty. So there are companies that can't do raises. So the fact that you, you think you're confident in the 30 mil raise is a significant, significant accomplishment. So congrats on that. But it's still, it's still, uh, I mean, there's a lot of faith goes into this and I'll, I'll, I'll Throw a question that my dad always used to talk to me about. My dad used to always say, a stock when they're in the penalty box, you're Canadian, you understand this concept, this hockey reference. A stock that's in a penalty box becomes a show-me stock, right? It becomes a show-me stock. Do you think you're a show-me stock? In other words, I'm done with you guys until you can show me the numbers that you're producing. And and how many consecutive quarters are you going to have to have of of hitting your your um, your, your projections before you're no longer a show me stock. Rob, I think the last few hurt you guys, obviously, right? I, I, I agree with that. And honestly, again, I do not have an issue with that. 
right? Being call it being a show me stock, I have no problems basically showing people uh, that we can deliver. One one of the things that uh, um, I think is going to be very telling for us, uh, very important, is the launch of the application, uh, the hub here in Canada. That's going to be a November. Talk to me about 30th. that. Yeah, talk to me okay. about that. So, 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 so November thirtieth, really, for as far as I'm concerned, is going to be kind of like our, our, our coming out party um, to North American uh, to North American investors, because again, China is a different model, right? Like, I mean, China is a communist country. You can't really allow people to to have you know um, the ability to post things on the internet. Uh, so uh, it's hard for us to really show people the way the hub works. But once we launch here in Canada at the end of November, uh, people are going to have a better sense of what the hub is like, how it's used, right? How it's useful for, for, um, for our members, for financial institutions and so on and so forth. And we're already, uh, we already have on the pre-registration campaign that we have right now, we already have over 2000 small businesses pre-registered. And by the time we even launch, right? By the time we even launch, we should have, Maybe three, four thousand uh, uh, small businesses pre-registered, five, six, maybe ten financial institutions, including banks um, that have already bought into the concept. So once all of this, you know, uh, uh, becomes more visible, I think people are going to have a different appreciation for the company. But as far as being a show me stock, I have no issues with that whatsoever. Like you said, the key is, can we, can we continue to move forward? Do we have enough capital? Do we not have enough financing, basically, to to be able to do that? And the uh, uh, the answer to that question is, without a doubt, yes. Because the six hundred. Sorry, go ahead. Because like I was, I was just going to say because I'm talking to our investors, right? I'm talking to the people that have supported the company in the past, and they're excited about what we're about to deliver. So, the we'll 2023 projections they include how much Canadian revenue. Uh, very little. In your, it's negligible. In your mind, it's negligible. It's negligible. It's not even worth mentioning. It, it really right. starts in 2023. It's in 2023 was my question. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So 2020, okay. 2023, it's not, it's still like 2023 is all going to be largely dependent on China still because, you know, we have to get the machine going and so on and so forth. So we're forecasting maybe... 10, 15 million, I would say, for uh, Yeah, and for 2024 Canada. in Canada? 2024, then it really starts to pick up. Then we, we start to look. It's not just Canada, by the way. 2024, we should be, like I mentioned, in addition to China, we should be in five additional countries, right? So that's when the revenue really starts to scale up outside of China, is in 2024. Yeah, one, one of the issues, and I think one of the challenges that the investors have is this whole Canadian hub launch has been very, I think, hush-hush, and like the specifics aren't shared that publicly. And we get that it's proprietary knowledge, but it feels like we're in a void with respect to kind of the numbers of the hub and how much revenue and what's it going to look like. So I'm glad you're sharing a little bit of that, but that's certainly, I think, some of the feedback you've received, I would think. We'll, we'll, we'll be a little bit more, um, I guess, once the, lob, once the hub la- launches officially in Canada, Obviously, like, I mean, we'll be a little bit more proactive in terms of marketing and, and getting news out specific to Canada, right? Like, I mean, the partnerships that we're going to be making, the new financial institutions that are going to be joining uh, the uh, uh, the ecosystem, that kind of stuff. But for now, like, I mean, it's it's done on purpose. Our marketing folks have a strategy. Uh, even the uh, the reveal of the new logo and stuff was kind of like kept under uh, under wraps until it, you know um, it was ready to go. So I trust our marketing folks to do uh, uh, that. They know what they're doing. Man, I think this industry, the way we operate in Canada, the way you guys should operate, it should be as much transparency as possible. I think after being in the penalty box uh, for your Q, was that Q one or Q two or whatever it was. Uh, I think if I were you guys, I would adopt a policy to be as transparent as possible with everything that you're doing, uh, obviously within the rules uh, of the Canadian disclosure requirements, sure. but uh, transparency is better, I would argue. Hey, I want to ask um, China, um, do, do you see any deterioration there? I get that you have growth. I understand that, that China is growing, but do you see any deterioration like recession indicators in your clientele and do you see kind of some slowdown there? Um, yes, obviously. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest that, yeah, there has been some slow, like, uh, um, some 
some clients specifically that have slowed down or whatever. But uh, just like any other business, we're, we're, we're adjusting, right? We're finding uh, new clients, uh, different verticals. Um, so despite the fact that, yes, the economy has slowed down in China, um, we have been able to adjust and to find new ways to continue to grow the business. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. Hey, um, the debt structure. Is there any way that you guys are able to add debt structure, more leverage to the business? Absolutely. Like, I mean, we're, 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 we're talking to um, one. I don't know. If, I, I wouldn't call them an investment banking firm, but we're, we're talking to uh, an entity right now um, for a potential debt uh, uh, instrument. What does that look like? Is it a convertible debt? Is it a coupon plus it could option be, to convert? It could be. Like I mean, we're, we're we're in the early stages of the discussions right now. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's not going to be cheap, I imagine. What What do you mean in terms of like? I mean, you're talking about the interest rate, or? the cost for the cost for tenant. No, I like. I mean, so far, like, I mean, what they're saying is sounds reasonable. Like, I mean, it's okay. not like it's not like you know credit card level debt type of thing or anything like that. Like, but obviously it, it you'd, want, you'd want to add as much as possible currently rather than dilute. Would that be your preference? If you had a $30 million debt offering that was convertible, some sort of subordinate debt, would you take that ahead of taking the 30 mil private issue offering? Uh, to be honest with you, like, I mean, right now we would take uh, what is available the quickest, right? Like, Obviously. I mean, because yeah, you know, we that, that that's the simple answer to that question. So if, if the debt, again, like I said, we, we just started discussion, so it's very unlikely that the debt would come in first. Right now, we have a prospectus um, that is under review right now, and we have potential clients that we're talking with. So for us, it's 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 the quickest way, basically, to get access to the funding that we need in order to continue to grow the business. Cash is king, right? Cash is king. Don't Absolutely. forget to subscribe, guys. I do have a couple more questions, but take a sec before I get to those. Press the button, press the like button, send us your comments, send us your thoughts. If you'd like to book a no obligation consultation with me to chat about this or anything else that's on your mind, specifically your portfolio, uh, go to www.speaktorob.com. We'd love to book that. I want to ask you about acquisitions. So there are companies yes. like IOU Financial, for example, seem to be doing the same stuff that in North America that you guys are doing in China, do some of those seem natural? And if yes, how would you fund those? Um, actually, IU Financial is 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 not doing um, – I, I would disagree with the statement that they're doing what kind of like what we're doing. They're, they're a lender. I'm sorry. My I'm research sorry. is no good. No, My no, research no, sorry, is no sorry. good. You see, the, the, the difference between IOU Financial, Rob, is they are a lender, right? Like, I mean, they, they, they lend to, to businesses, right? So they're a financial institution. We're not. We are an aggregator. So, right. So, IU Financial would actually be a, a lender within the business hub. So, we could work with them for them to become one of the lenders that are on our platform because it's not just banks and credit unions. We consider IU Financial to be an alternative lender and they could be part of the ecosystem and be matched with uh, uh, lending opportunities, right? But as far as acquisitions are concerned, um, we, again, we're, we're, we're not a lender. We're not strictly a fintech company. We're an analytics and artificial intelligence company. So what we're looking right now in terms of acquisition, and I'm glad you brought this up, is we're looking at acquiring uh, market intelligence companies, market research companies, artificial intelligence companies. That's where our focus is. And uh, going forward, yes, we are. There, there, there are actually a couple right now like uh, in our sites. That we're looking at valuations have come down dramatically on those. I would imagine it, it, it's not. It's not about. It's not about just valuation. And, and, but it and has to be to... at some point, Johnson. Right? Because you you don't have unlimited capital, right? You can't just buy Facebook, right? Like... I, listen, I I understand that everything okay, and it's time one step at a time. I'm not talking about like you know acquiring these companies today, but listen. The markets have taken a, 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 a turn for the worst. And this is, I actually have a couple of questions for you, Rob, if you don't mind, right? Because y y you're an advisor, right? So, so right now, our share, I understand our shareholders are not happy. They look at the company, they look at their portfolios, their portfolios are melting. They're like, okay, what's wrong? What's wrong with PKK? Uh, you know, we've lost what 90%, if not more of our value, whatever. So that's us. But I'm looking around, okay, at other specifically tech companies, like, you know, who are kind of like in, in our sector. I'm looking at small cap, mid, large cap companies. And I don't want to, I, I, I hate to name other companies, but, okay, you look at a, a company like Shopify, 
right? I, 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 maybe you can edit this out if you don't want me mentioning them or whatever. But I believe, like, I mean, Shopify at one point, if I'm not mistaken, they were the most valued com- the most valued Canadian yeah. company. Shopify they passed their was- VC. Yes, they, they were worth more than the Royal Bank. And you look at Shopify today, I think they've lost like 80 or 85% of their value. Now, what's wrong with Shopify? I don't know. I don't follow the company, to be honest with you. But what's wrong with Shopify? Shopify was a victim of the economic downturn. You know, the technology, like everything in tech got hit. Okay. It's not just here in Canada. Look across the border. There are companies that could be comparable to us. And you look at all of them. And I've done the exercise. All of them, Rob, have lost 75, 80, 90% of their values, right? So, so, so if I'm looking at this, yes, you know, we've had, Okay, you said we're in the penalty box. I get that. You know, we had to revise our guidance or whatever. And the whole NASDAQ thing, you know, uh, uh, hurt us, right? The NASDAQ thing, right? The deal, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a thing, yes. So that hurt us, right? But eventually, I'm expecting things to get back to some sense of normalcy, right? Like, I mean, you know, for the markets in general, whatever. Valuations. Ex- You're talking about valuations uh, of Yes, companies. I'm talking about, yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? So I don't expect. You know, Shopify to remain down in the basement. They're, they're, they're fund- fundamentally sound company. They're a great company as far as I, as, as far as I know and other companies as well. So, so if I'm looking at, if I'm looking at tenant, right, we will execute on our business plan, right? So we're going to deliver on our numbers. I don't expect the company's market cap to remain where it's at right now. So eventually, yes, you know, doing an acquisition right now when we are down in the basement, wouldn't actually wouldn't necessarily make sense, but as we continue to execute and things get, you know, the valuations get closer to normal, whatever, I think we'll be in a position to make some interesting valuations. Now, my question for you, Rob, is I can't wait. Okay, so we have okay. I I know we have disgruntled shareholders or whatever and stuff like that, and and, and I get that, right? And I'm looking at my portfolio too. I'm like, you know what? Like, yeah, you know, I I'd much rather you know look at it or or, or see it. When our stock was, you know, at twelve, thirteen dollars, right, as opposed to today, I get that, right. But as a as a financial advisor, right, uh, a, a capital markets expert, you have clients, right. I, I'm That's sure, like, yeah, yeah, right. So, so their portfolios. I'm sure you're great at what you do, right? But I can't imagine that everybody's portfolios are going up. Some people must be like, okay, what's going on? They're calling you, asking you questions. So what do you tell your clients about? Like, I mean, do you not like, what what, what do you tell them about the tech sector in general? Okay, so this is a very good question. So first off for us, we're big believers in asset allocation and alternative asset allocation. So we have 30, 40% of our clients in alternative assets. Those are up 10, 12, 14% this year. So that's a phenomenal diversifier away from traditional stocks. So our balance clients might be down 4 or 5% this year. So we're outperforming by a boatload this year. This has been a banner year for us. We're up on the max growth, on the growth, and on the defensive. So we're really, really pleased with that. But to answer your question about tech, categorically answer your question about tech, I think there are two types of tech stocks. There are tech stocks that will survive unequivocally. Our strong companies have good earnings you know, the largest and, and most solid ones where you don't have to worry about owning it. You know, if you own, uh, you know, Google or Microsoft, you're going to be fine. Those companies are profitable. They're growing their earnings every right. year. It's going to come back to a 15, 20, 25, 30 valuation at some point. You are okay to own that. Now, there are other companies which will not survive. And the risk and the reason that those companies are trading, anyone that was trading at a multiple of sales, you know, they always say, how, you know, how do you measure a 90% drop? It's a drop of 70% followed by another drop of 70%, right? And I think we're going to see that. And we are seeing that with some of these companies. They're down 90, 95%. I think the names that like you were in this category, category companies that weren't profitable, had a ton of growth, but were trading on a huge multiple of sales. All of a sudden the market's saying, are these guys going to survive? The answer is, you bet on the ones that are going to survive, you're going to make a ton of money, a ton of money unequivocally. So if you guys survive, you don't go bankrupt and you deliver on your earnings and you be, you are a show me stock, so you, you will pull out of the penalty box, you're going you're gonna to make a lot of money owning this stock. So the question that the investors are asking is, do I trust these guys to deliver on that? Do I trust Johnson Joseph to deliver and his team to deliver on what they say they're going to do. Because there's a whole bunch of your competitors that are doing the same thing. They're saying we're down 95%, 90%. We're not going bankrupt. We're going to survive. We're going to make this. And when we do, and we're not going to dilute the company. There's not going to be 15 raises at, at 10 cents and 20 cents. 
you're going to make it back to 10 or $15. So that's the debate. Now, where do I think you guys fall? I, I certainly, uh, you know, I, I believe in you. I've known you for a long time. I believe in you. I need, you know, me like the other investors, like if you deliver on these next two quarters, Johnson, your stock will reflect that. And then you'll probably need a couple quarters to catch up, but it's going to be unbelievable. So answer your tech. I think not all tech are created equal. And the, at some point in the cycle, we'll get back to the point where tech stocks, growth stocks are trading at 25, 30, 35 times. It's going to happen. Okay. Terrific. You know what? That's, that, that, that's fair. Um, I could not if you for, disagree, for, if you no, disagree, no, no, I, I don't, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. Like, I mean, uh, I, I think it's well put and, uh, we couldn't ask for anything more than, you know, an opportunity, like show me that's what, that's what it's all about. And like you said, the key for us is the funding, you know, because right now, obviously, um, you know, we're not a profitable company, right? So we do need to depend on the capital markets for growth or whatever, the great thing about us is that we have surrounded ourselves with very trustworthy investors, people that believe in the company that I know I can go back to. Like, I, I don't even have to go to them. Like, I mean, as soon as, like, I mean, before we even, you know, file the prospectus, they're like, okay, Johnson, when are you filing? What are the terms or whatever? People are excited about what we're doing. So I'm, that's why I'm so confident. I'm, I'm sitting here right now in front of you being this confident because I know these people are there. We have the support. So the financing is not going to be an issue. Like, I mean, we're going to be able to close on this financing and uh, continue to execute our plan and, uh, and, and show people. Like, like I said before, the one of the most important things for us in terms of being able to show is are we able to get small businesses and financial institutions to buy into this concept? We've proven it in China. We're in the process of doing it right now in Canada. We're going to show it in the U.S. Uh, listen, I was at an event uh, uh, literally like two days ago, uh, Asia Pacific Association of Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, fantastic organization uh, promoting uh, um, business for small businesses across the Asia Pacific region. So they just launched really uh, uh, their offices here in Montreal. I was invited to the event. Uh, there was a panel where we we're talking about artificial intelligence and small businesses. <clears throat> and listen, um, there are financial institutions there that had never heard of, you know, um, Tenet or Kubler, the business club or whatever, and small businesses, CEOs of small businesses, owners of small businesses. And uh, at that event, we were swarmed. Really, like people were coming to us. Listen, uh, how come I have never heard of you guys? I said, listen, you know, we are, we've operated right uh, so far. We've only been operating in China. We're coming uh, uh, um, with the uh, with the platform in Canada in November. Listen, collected all kinds of business cards. We have small small businesses who are like, okay, you know what? I want to be a test case for you guys. Like, I mean, where where can I pre register? I want to use all your services. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and really be like, you know serve as a testimonial for what the business hub can do for a small business. So, so, so the proof of concept has been done. The response right now that we're getting from Canadian financial institutions and small business owners is fantastic. So that's why we're so excited, Rob. We, we have get no the doubt excitement that this and is going to be a love success. That. I love that excitement. Cause I mean, if you weren't excited, then we'd have serious issues here. Um, and that's good. I think there's a little bit of a difference between the, the micro execution at the lower level, which is signing up businesses, which I think you guys have proven that you're able to do, and then managing the macro of the business itself and the CEO in this landscape. Like we're talking in October 2022, where right. NASDAQs are down 30%, and you know we're constantly seeing the VIX above 30. It's a very scary time, and you guys, unfortunately, are in the wrong industry at the wrong time right now, right? Right, right now, right. But again, Rob, short-term problem. I'm looking at the big picture always, right? So, yeah, so we're, I we're, like we're, that we're, about you. Yeah, I like we're that going, we're going through a, through a phase right now. Like you know, it's it's tough. Whatever. I'm talking to people. Whatever. But you know yourself, we're not going to remain here. You're saying it yourself. Like I mean, tech is going to bounce back eventually. All the all it, it's cyclical, right? So yeah. people are concerned right now. There are all kinds of factors: high interest rates, inflation, blah blah, and stuff like that. I get it. Fine. Like, I mean, but to me, it's a temporary issue. We're going to get through this. And then on the other side, to me, it blue skies. Dude, if you get to $1 billion of revenue in two years, I mean, we'll watch this video and we'll be like, holy smokes. Like he said, we'd get there. He got there. The stock today is at X. 
So now basically the ball's in your court to deliver, Johnson. And I, I want to thank you for it's taking the time for. It. Yeah, you've 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 given some time for us today, and I appreciate that. And I've given you some hard questions because I think it's important to hear directly from you. And I didn't want to bullshit you, and I didn't want to you know fluff you up with some softballs. So I, I thought I would hit hard home with the tough questions. We're out of time, so I do want to thank you. Anything else you want to add? No, that's it. Listen, I appreciate the opportunity. Very candid conversation. Listen, it's you know. It, I, I think it's what's best for our shareholders when they hear things like, I mean, unrehearsed or whatever, like, you know, just having a conversation like this. I think that it's 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 one of the best things we could have done. So I appreciate the opportunity. Obviously, I could not have organized this my, myself. So having people like you basically reaching out, asking the questions, it benefits us and it benefits our shareholders. So I appreciate and it. And I'm Thank speaking you. on behalf of everyone who owns the stock and it, it puts you accountable, right? And it's, it's more transparency. So I think it's good for you to do this and we'll do it again in, in a six months or a year and we'll see where we're at. And, and I wonder if the stock will be up or down the day I release this video. Who knows? We'll I see. I think it'll be up. I think it'll be up, Johnson. Thank you so much for taking the time, guys. Rob Tatro, portfolio manager at CG Wealth from robtatro.com. Thank you so much for taking the time, guys. We'll see you in the next video. See you. Thanks.